We welcome to the Only Fools and Horses podcast, Philip Pope, who played the part of Tony Angelino. How's it going? Very well, thank you. 40 years and counting, apparently. Wow, yeah. So tell us, first of all, how did you get the part? Just bad luck, I think. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, it came through the post. It was completely unexpected. I got, I got a script through the post, uh, which my agent sent to me. And, uh, and I remember I was, it, I think it arrived on a Saturday morning. So I was actually just lying in bed with my wife, you know, sort of, and, the, and I said, oh, look, the script has arrived. And of course it said, you know, the, the sending of the script does not mean there's a, uh, a promise of a part or something like that on the front. So I thought, oh, okay. Um, anyway, so I, and it said, you know, we have suggested you read the part of Tony Angelina. So I read it and we sat there, and, you know, just read it. And uh, I thought, oh, this is all very exciting. Because by this stage, I think this was late 80s or early 90s, about 1990, I think, 1991. And the, uh, so it was about 30 years ago. So, you know, Only Fools and Horses had been going several years. So it was, it was already very established. Uh, so I think this was the seventh series. Um, anyway, so that's that's how, it, how I got the part and uh, it came through the post and, and yes, I said I'd love to do it and, and that's that really. But there was a point in it, I don't know if you remember the story of the episode which I was in, um, there was a point where Del Boy and Rodney go and see Tony Angelino singing at the Down by the Riverside Club and you know this, it's, this sort of scene which was quite uh, happened quite a lot I think in those days of, of these sort of guys being sort of, um, of of you know likes of hen parties and that sort of thing and, and w women sort of waving chucking their knickers and all this sort of stuff so that was all happening on on the screen um, anyway so, so so this this there was a scene in that where um, where they go backstage after this uh, performance and they you know and Del Boy's there, you know, with his cash, uh, cashmere coat or camel coat, etc. And so he's trying to be this Bengali, and Rodney being sort of embarrassed slightly in the background. And there's this whole scene where where they're trying to get him to um, to persuade him to to sing with Raquel. And all the time, my character is is disrobing, so he's you know taking off his wig and revealing that he's you know haven't got much hair. And he takes off his shirt, and he's and he's got a you know it's it's all it's not it's 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 a fake tan. So there's a great V down here where he's put on the tan, and there's and then it goes and then the next bit is where he takes off his shoes, his platforms. So sort of Del Boy does a great thing where he turns around and then sort of goes look, double takes and sees that actually Tony has shrunk six inches, mm -hmm. and then the last thing of course is when the as when he. Um, where Tony takes out his cod piece and sort of hands it to Del Boy, and Del Boy sort of then goes, <laughs> hands it to uh, to Rodney, who then realises what he's like, ah! like that. So it's and all that was very was very carefully choreographed. But at this point, my wife, oh no, and then and then there was a bit where it says it turns out that actually my character can't say his R's, and my wife can't say her R's. So she turned to me and said, is this some kind of a joke? <laughs> I said, well, I, I think it's supposed to be a joke, but I don't think it's on you, my dear. Uh, I think, if anything, it's on me. Anyway, so, um, so I accepted the part. And, uh, and the rest is, as they say, carrots. No, history, that's the word. <laughs> Do you know so, the scene you're talking about. about there, Philip? You know the scene you're talking about there in, yeah. the, in the changing room? I was Googling, and I, I've never known this before, but there's um, a deleted scene, isn't there? Just uh, after you've finished, can you, remember, can you remember the deleted scene? No. No. So what, it, yeah, so <laughs> obviously I've never seen this deleted scene, by the way, so it could be deleted, but... I haven't, I haven't compared the script with the, with the, the final broadcast version. So I, I, I don't know, I think, I think you may have filmed it, actually, but obviously didn't, you know, didn't go well, to broadcast. But it's, when you come out of the changing room... Yeah. There's a lady um, that goes past you, say, I want to see Tony, I want to see Tony, because you're in your normal uh, yeah, clothes, yeah, the woman yeah. hasn't even recognised that you're Tony. 
I remember mm. that now. I remember that in the script, but obviously they thought that it was, you know, uh, it, it stood, or maybe it was just too long, you know, so they had to cut something. Um, did you actually film that though? Or I'm did just that trying to remember if we actually filmed mm. it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So, it. I'll have to so, check. I think so, so back to the part of where you can't pronounce your R's. Yeah. Of course, yeah. that's the big gag. In, yeah. in the whole episode, really. I mean, that has to be, for me, one of the funniest moments in Only Fools and Horses when you're singing the duet with Raquel and nobody knows about it, do they, until that moment. Remind us what happens. <laughs> well, a big build-up. And there's a lot riding on this because, you know, Del Boy, not only has he sort of, does he think that Tony and Raquel are going to be a big double act, um, in those days, there was a sort of, um, I think the reference was Peters and Lee. There were a couple of, you know, sort of male and female duet or a bit like sort of Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton or something like that. So that in those days, there was, it was quite a, you know, duets were quite a big thing. So, there, and there's quite a lot riding on it because Del Boy thinking he was going to be in a big manager um, and everyone's going to make loads of money, of course. Um, he he managed to get a, a gig for Raquel and Tony, but the only gig he could get was for the local hoods. Um, was it Eric? I can't remember. His mm. his, his his mother's uh, 80th birthday uh, party, I and mean, so it was quite a big thing. And and the guy the guy who was the in between was sort of making it seem as you know you better get it right, otherwise you know. <laughs> you know, this you he love your guts for garter sort of thing, whereas Delboy was thinking, hmm, well, you know, I've I've got there's six hundred quid or whatever it is riding on this, but but don't tell Raquel. Um, so so there was there was quite a lot riding on. It. So it was, it was a big build up, and then finally the moment comes, and you know, Raquel comes on and and starts singing, um, to Roy Orbison's Roy Orbison song crying and he and she starts you know singing it very sort of beautifully and all the rest of it and Tony comes on and then builds up to the big chorus where he says well he, instead of saying crying he goes crying and and at which point everyone's going crying what's he talking about what's he saying and and of course what and this has been alluded to beforehand but uh, and Raquel has even said to 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 Del Boy, you know, you know, Tony's got a problem, you know, and Del Boy won't, won't he doesn't want to hear any, anything about it, apart from anything else, he's got to go to court. So that there is this sort of sense that there's this big build-up, you know, the audience knows, you know, there's this dramatic irony and so forth. The, the audience knows there's something wrong, but they but they don't know what it is. And then suddenly, you know, you have this moment and he goes quiet, and every everyone realizes. He can't say his R's, you know, and it sounds a bit silly, you know, and of course it's, you know, the one song that you, if you're singing, if you can't say your R's, you don't really want to sing. But, you know, Tony Angelino gives it all he's got, you know, and it's full of, there was a, it was sort of based on a sort of Tony Christie, Tom Jones, there were, there were a couple of big sort of singers at the time who were that sort of, you know, hairy chest, curly hair, you know, medallion tan you know and it was you know very very uh sexy so and 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 big voice and uh, and everyone loved them um so it was sort of based on that and uh, yeah, so that was the big moment and he couldn't say and you know del boy sort of used to cut back to i think it cuts to del boy again you know um mouthing crying of course rodney sort of you know, killing himself, laughing next to it, next to him, so, yeah, and then so you know, no, it's fine. So it was, uh, it was a, a great. Uh, it, it was, it was, it was very well written. I mean, that, the whole thing about you know these scripts was they were just beautifully crafted, and John Sullivan was a, a, an absolute master when it came to this. I mean, a lot of the you know the acting and all the and all the mechanics of, 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 the, of the comedies is was you know well managed by the, the, the you know the, the director and the producer and the, but but actually mainly some of the actors you know that scene what we talked to we talked about before um about uh backstage where where tony takes off his all, all his 
stuff and reveals that he's, you know, looks completely different from how he does on stage. Uh, and that whole thing with the, uh, the, 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 the Savaloy, as, as it was referred to, um, the, the cod piece, that was really um, choreographed by David Jason. Um, you know, he was the one who, who, who was saying, oh, no, no, we've got to make sure that, you know, you turn that way and Rodney, you turn that way. And so, that, you know, we can't see each other. So when we, we turn back to each other, you know, it's important that you don't see him hand it to me. So there's all the, all the mechanics of it were worked out mainly by David. Um, and he'd had a lot of experience um, on stage. Uh, in fact, I first saw him playing uh, Norman in the Norm Norman Conquests, a brilliant trilogy of plays by Alan Akeborn, um, where he played this character, and it's in three different um, three different plays, but all but set in three different places, but they're all interlinked. So it's an incredibly clever piece of writing. So David had that experience, and he. I, I should say Sir David had had that experience and he and so it was that was really him and of course you know Nick Lindhurst was would have been able to uh, chip in as well um I suppose I was I'd had a bit of experience by then as well but but it was but it was mainly David who who sorted it all out so it was it was but but it was the writing to start off with and I think that's what all I mean if you talk to anyone I'm sure you have you talk to you know Don Chalice or Sue Holderness or anyone who's who's who knows those scripts intimately, they'll tell you that it's it it was the genius of the writing which really um, made it what it is. And of course, as an actor, it's fantastic when you have those sort of scripts because you know everything is is just beautifully crafted, rock solid, and you and 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 funny. And but of course, uh, you know, it, it's it, it's so much the, the character. So as I say, you know, by the by the time I was, I I got off of this part, only fools and horses had been, you know, a, a real it was already a success. So it was in a way it was quite a big thing and quite nerve wracking as well because you think mm, going into this show where they're, they're, they're all these people who are established TV stars. But actually, they were really, really nice, and couldn't have been more welcoming and 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 more helpful, really. And it's just so typical that Del Boy picks every song that has the letter R in it, pretty much, doesn't he? What was it? The Green Green Glass of Home, um, <laughs> Walk Walk and Roll Dreams, wasn't it? <laughs> a, a medley of Walk and Roll. Oh, yes. That's it. Yeah. Uh, green Green Glass. Of... Yeah, and and also. There's that, another great line where he talks about the, um, you know, the a, a singer whose props come from um, Lily White, Brown Toppers, one. Lillian Skinner's, and Mattersons. Yeah, yeah. Lillian. Do you have any of props? Singer. Sorry, do you have, sorry, Philip. Do you have any of the props at all? The shirt or the wig or the cod piece? <laughs> I strangely didn't keep them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, none of them, no. well, they, well, generally, you see, when you do a TV show, certainly in those days, you know, you a lot of the stuff was probably hired or, or you know, it was maybe bought and then sold on or, you know, or, or put into the BBC costume store. So it wasn't, or maybe it came from the BBC costume store. So it wasn't actually, uh, you know, they didn't say, here, you have this £200 shirt or whatever. Um, not that I'm saying that they would have cost that, but. No, so sadly, I haven't got any of those those things. Although I think you can buy them pretty much um, <laughs> around the place. You can probably get them, you know, online from a from an Only Fools and Horses uh, uh, store if there is one. Well, I know there is a sort of one, but I'm not sure if you can actually buy shirts. But in fact, the prop has been exhibited at Margate. I think actually thinking about it, your shirt and your wig, well, hasn't it? And tra know, white trousers was it you wore? Yes, white trousers. Yes, well, actually, uh, um, yeah, Perry, uh, you know, who runs the the, the, the conventions. I mean, he yeah. has a lot of the a lot of the props and and that sort of stuff. So he maybe maybe that he's got the original ones. I don't know, um, but I but I haven't got them. Yeah, in those the, days, as I say, there was a BBC costume store which was massive. It had absolutely you know, huge amounts of costumes and stuff. Anyway. 
What was the best part about working on set with everyone from All Fools and Horses? The best part? Well, I think it was it was quite exciting because it was, you know, you felt as if you're you know, taking part in something which was, or as I say, was already you know, a successful, very popular show. Um, so it, it, in a way, it, you, I felt as if I was punching a little bit above my weight, you know, sort of, you know, mm. oh, look, there's David Jason. You know, <laughs> so it was, it was a bit strange in that, that, those first days, but because they were so sort of normal and, and welcoming, um, and all of them actually, it, you know, Ken McDonald, you know, who was the, the farmer and everything, he was really helpful and, and you know, John and Sue and, and you know, they were, uh, Roger Lloyd Pack was, um, in fact, my, my sister who's a, who who's a, runs a dental practice, uh, you know, she used to, Roger used to have it, his teeth done at her dental practice. So I sort of, I already had an in there. I said, oh, my sister knows you. So, so it was, you know, but it was, it was, uh, I think it was, it just felt, you know, I felt it was sort of, I was, it was an honor. So I was a bit afraid of making a mistake, you know, and I, I wanted to make sure I got it right. So make sure you learn all your lines properly and, 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 and just, but the heart for me is sort of pinching myself the whole time, sort of thinking, I can't believe I'm actually doing this. <laughs> so there you are. How long would it take to film, Philip, your scenes? Would it take quite a, quite a while or? Oh, longer than yeah. anyone else's, yeah. No. Um, <laughs> no, you know, like is it a few um, days work, work or? Well, no, but, well, most of it was done um, in the studio. I mean, there were a couple of, there, there, were, there were the scenes which were the, the actual performance scenes. So the, the singing, um, I mean, first of all, because um, there was music involved, we had to pre-record the music. So we went out to a, a studio. Actually, I later got to, um, to, get, got to know the guy who, who owned the studio because he's a bass player who um, he used to play with a drummer, uh, a drummer who I used to work with quite a lot called John Trotter, who, who actually was because um, I'm you know I write music as well and so I you know I worked with with this guy and he he said oh you must have talked to Paul you know and then I said oh I think I know him you know but I think we recorded in his studio near just outside Henley um, anyway so we went to this place I had to record the music they recorded the backing track um, Kenny the MD was there and um, and and then we did the, and then we recorded the vocals. So Tessa and, and I recorded the vocals um, because the idea was that because it was pre-recorded sound, um, you, we, we were going to mime to it and they didn't want to, you know, so just to be on the safe side, um, they didn't want to set up all the, all the, the band live and, and everything because that would just be an extra layer of production which would be, could go wrong on the day. And on those days, particularly the, the, the scenes in the, Actually, it was I think it was in the Locarno Ballroom in Bristol. Um, they um, where they recorded it. It was. Um, I it mean, was, it, I think it was Bristol. I think it's called the Fiddlers Club or something, isn't it? I was looking. I, I, don't, I don't know what it's called now. I think in those days it was called the Locarno Ballroom, but it was, uh, which was part of the Colston Hall um, set up around there. Because um, I'm from that area, so I, I knew it quite well. Um, uh, but there were, as I say, there were quite a lot of uh, extras and, and people there, so that you know, if they got sort of forty or fifty extras, and, and so so we pre-recorded the music and and the and the voices, um, and then um, and I think we may have done the same for the down by the Riverside Club. But thinking about it, I think I may have sung that line. I can't remember. Anyway. Um, but when we came to do it, when we came to actually shoot those scenes in Bristol uh, on the day, I think we decided, well, it would be easier if we, if we just perform it live. But, and well, I say we, you know, it was decided and sort of Tessa and I were going, oh, <laughs> got to do it live. <laughs> but, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't, wasn't ready for this, but we did it. And actually, you know, we, so, so those performances were, were actually performed live. It was to the backing track. Um, the, 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 the band wasn't playing live, but we were singing live. So that's sort of, 
adds an extra sort of interesting gloss, I think. Um, and then the other scenes were um, were done, uh, and and the scene, and the other scene, which was uh, the the one with all the business. You know what I mean by business? The the the, the comic business that. You know, the Savaloy and all that. That was that was done. Uh, that was pre-recorded. I think. I, can't, I think that may have been at BBC Television Centre. Anyway, it, wherever it was done, it was it was um, it was pre-recorded. I think on the Thursday or the Friday, and then and then the rest of the scenes, you know, in the pub and the and the flat were were done live in front of Studio L Street on the Saturday or the Sunday, I can't remember. Um, so... so they used to film on Sunday, didn't they, the show, I, I think, believe? I think it was a Sunday, yeah. Mm. And the... So the other... So the scenes which were, um, which were done in Bristol, and I think the down, down by the riverside was done in South East London, I think, or somewhere in, somewhere around there. They were... They were... They were um, obviously done in advance and um and i think we i think we st i think we did i think it was just one day shooting the stuff in bristol and one day shooting the stuff on the, down by the riverside um but of course they all had to be edited and assembled and etc etc to be played in to the live audience um as if they were sort of sequential within the, in the within the story which is what happens as you know um, yeah in in uh, you know when you when you do live shows, and I'm just wondering, have you ever sung that song again at like a karaoke night or something? Like, <laughs> have you sung "Crying" in the Tony Angelino style at a karaoke night? I hope so. <laughs> never, never, no. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> Once was enough. <laughs> I've never sung. Funny enough, I've never sung that song as Tony Angelino or, or with the you know the W again. <laughs> In fact, I don't think I've ever sung it. I don't really do karaoke much. I mean, I ne nearly did karaoke once with um, um, Darren Litton, you know, who who writes, um, uh, who wrote, I should say, Benidorm. Uh, oh, yeah. he's, he's, they were big on um, karaoke. In fact, Darren, I think, is, is I think he was the successor. In my view, he's, he's like the successor to John Sullivan in his, the way he, uh, he sort of, handles those sort of characters and has quite a sort of broad brushstroke of comedy anyway that's my own personal view it's particularly in Benidorm but um yeah no I've never sung never sung it I don't think I don't I don't really go in for karaoke much but uh I don't know what I do if I when I have done karaoke I can't remember what I've done probably mm -hmm. some Frank Sinatra or something you know but but it's repeated on the tv so much anyway so you wouldn't need to do it again anyway would you really <laughs> <laughs> well i'm sure that there are other people who who do it um in fact at the end of the um at the, at the end of uh, the the shooting uh, when we filmed it tony dowd the director came up to me and said well you know if all else fails you've got a future singing in the northern clubs <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i thought well okay so, uh, in fact, my wife says to me, she says, you know, you should, you should take, you should go out and, and sing as Tony Angelino, you know, give the people what they want. I said, well, I don't know what the people do want it, but, you know, maybe one day. You'll be which? <laughs> <laughs> don't know about that. <laughs> you still get recognised in the street for the part, Philip, as well? Do people quote lines from the show to you or? Well, I don't look exactly how I did then mm. but, but people with good facial recognition sort of do sort of say in fact recently i was down in i can't remember it's down in a um tube station in in london and um and the guy on the on, on the, the, the the ticket you know one of the employees of london transport sort of stopped me and said i know you and then he just he said uh he, well he 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 he's, he mentioned quieing of course and then he and then he went on to say because i also recently at that time done a part in benidorm um as a character called winter smallcock <laughs> which was <laughs> which was an interesting one i don't think i don't think it was typecast i hope not um but it 
but because of my wintry disposition. But uh, anyway, he 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 recognised me for that as well. Uh, so so there are a, there are a few people who that used to drive my my wife mad. You know, she'd sort of say, you know, oh blimey, I didn't you know didn't marry you, so you get stopped in Sainsbury's. <laughs> But there you are. Did you keep the script? I did. And in fact, I found it the other day. Wow. It's mm. up in my attic. <laughs> I'm not telling you where I live, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was surprised. I was, uh, yes, because my wife was saying, you'd better clear out that attic. <laughs> you know, it's a load of rubbish up there. And I said, actually, I found this. She said, yeah, rubbish. I said, do you remember this script? And she said, yes, I remember it very well. <laughs> Um, no, so I've, I've still got it. Um, I didn't read it, actually. I should go back and, and, and read it and find uh, look out for that scene that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Did you, did, you laugh out, did you laugh quite a bit when you first read it? You thought, wow, this is hilarious. Or... Uh, yeah, yeah, I could see that it was, you know, well, I could look. Well, well I, I remember speaking to John Sullivan about it um, the night before we shot the, 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 the scenes in the, uh, the ballroom. Um, you know the actual singing scene, the big crying reveal, because uh, we were staying. I think it was a holiday inn in Bristol. And anyway, we, so we're having dinner, and, and he said to me, he said it was one of the hardest things he'd, he'd uh, ever written because he had to make sure he had to, he had to go back and check that um, none of what I said leading up to um, the reveal had any words with ours in it. Mm. Mm. Um, so he he went through and checked it and made sure it was right. In fact, I think I slipped one in, which um, by mistake, and um, and, I, and he wasn't there on that day. And uh, I'm sure he would have picked it up, but, oh. um, but no one else noticed it. Of course- I'll go back and have a look there. Yeah. <laughs> a, few, a few fans have, have, noticed, have noticed it um, and pointed it out to me. And I say, yeah, well, that's, my fault it's it's not you know and I remember on the day thinking I think I just said a word with an R in it should I own up to it and I thought no surely they would they would point it out but anyway <laughs> so I, I shouldn't really admit to that but uh, but I do remember John saying to me it was one of the hardest things that was one of the hardest things he'd had to do just because you know it, he had to make it sound natural and and to uh, you know, continue, make it, continue the conversation. Um, so all my lines had to be words without R's in, which is very difficult to do. So um, I'm sure he had more difficult things that he's written, but in in that sort of particular sort of way, when it's like, oh, you know, I've got to check that you know, has it got an R in it? Um, so yeah. So I can't remember what the question was now, but there you go. Am I right in saying that you're going to be um, doing an Only Fools and Horses event in October? I think so. Yeah? I, I think I read that online just before we started Thank the you. interview. Where about? Um, which one? I think I'm doing two, actually, in October. Is it, is it with Patrick Murray, Chris, is it? There's a few, there's a few actors. And, um, uh, yeah, I'm doing yeah, well. Yeah, played The Shadow as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's Va Vaz Blackwood, isn't it? Blackwood. Mm. Yeah, that's in uh, Wimbledon. Uh, not Wimbledon, Wolverhampton, I think. Great. I think Paul Barber might be there as well, actually. Denzel. Really? Possibly. Yeah. Was the um, was it good last weekend? Because you had a Nag Z pop up pub, didn't you, for UK Gold last week? Was that good? Looked good. That was great, actually. That was very. Uh, it was brilliant. I mean, the way they'd um, they'd done it. Was, I spoke to the designer, well, one of the design team, uh, Leela. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the company that do it. Um, anyway, um, and, and had a team, and they and it was brilliant. All the detail was extraordinary. It really looked like it. Because I said to her, you know, where do you find this pub? Because it was actually it is a pub, um, but they just changed the name to the Nags Head that day. Um, but the uh, were extraordinary things in there. You know, they said, "What's your favourite bit?" And I said, "Oh, actually, I think it was the the cigarette machine because you don't really see them anymore." Um, in the days when I smoked, I used to remember those, but that was many years ago. Um, but every little detail was fantastic, and it was lovely to see, uh, you know, Gwyneth and uh, and Andre 
shall I say, Cassandra. And um, <laughs> Nervous Neris, wasn't she, Andre? Yeah. So that was that was good fun. And also, uh, the prices of the drinks were the same as in the 80s, weren't they? I heard. Yes, they said, uh, yeah, 83p a pint. Wow. They're like eight pounds now or something. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, not well, in London, they probably are. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what they are in, in the rest of the country. Yeah, I live out of London, and it's probably about a five or a pint out here. But about, about, you? about three quid in Blackpool for a pint. Three quid in Blackpool. Blackpool. Oh, that's cheap. Oh, well, that's <laughs> cool. We're up to Blackpool. That's good. Yeah, let's yeah. go to Blackpool. <laughs> pint of what? <laughs> yeah, pint uh, of what? John Smith's bit uh, lager, stuff like that. But Three quid. Very good. Three, four quid. Wrong with a lager. Hot lager and stuff. So Um, what's your best memory from Only Fools and Horses, Philip? Best memory? Well, um, I think it was probably the the night itself, uh, the recording night. Just, you know, being there in front of the audience. And, um, and, you know, as it were, being on stage with David Jason and Mick Lindhurst and, and all, the, all the cast, it was, it was just such an honour in a way at the time. It was, it, I felt so, you know, oh, I can't believe it, as I said before. But, and what I found interesting about it, actually, from a sound point of view, because I'm, you know, I have a bit of a sound background in, and in terms of uh, you know microphones and that sort of thing because i'm a composer as well and songwriter um was the the le- different levels of performance you know you could tell that david jason so david was um you know had rig- had you know done theater and also he'd done radio and he'd, he'd done all sorts of loads of stuff um and of course he you know um done open all hours i think already by that stage Mm-hmm. Um, so he had, you know, a lot of experience, but his performance style was was quite different from, say, Nick Lindhurst, who's, you know, he had, you know, quite a, you know, his he was very sort of measured and and quite a sort of small performance in a way. Well, not small, but you know, his his it was very sort of a bit subtler, if you like. You know, David was, you know, a much bigger character. Um, and, and 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 in a way, sort of uh, the sort of slightly put down Rodney was, you know, he was sort of doing a lot of you know back chat, but it was all sort of quite small. So so what you had was you had Nick Lindhurst. I, I remember talking to the sound guy about it. And he said, "Oh, well, I've got to put a a, a, a a lapel mic, you know, on on Nick to pick him up because he's got quite a sort of you know uh, low volume delivery, but." David, when he gets in front of an audience, you know, we, we're actually sort of doing him on a boom, so we can, um, because, you know, he's he's got quite a big performance, so that really sort of interesting, and I was sort of thinking, well, what do I do? Where do I, do I, do I, and they said, just be yourself, just do it naturally, and and we'll pick you up, you know, it's, so, uh, but that was the, I think that's, the, the you know, the biggest, the most um, exciting memory was actually just that day, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. <laughs> no, but I mean, there've been you know other. I've been to have done a couple of conventions since, and they've been they've been quite good fun. Um, but in terms of the actual the program itself, I think you know it was that. I mean, the strange thing is, of course, you know, I only did one episode, and you know, <laughs> they did what seven series plus God knows goodness knows Six, how many sixty four episodes apparently sixty four. I know, extraordinary, isn't it? Plus mm. um, loads and loads of, of other um, specials and Christmas specials and, and what have you. Um, so, so, so to you know, to, to be remembered for, for one one performance in one in one episode really is 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 extraordinary. But I was talking to I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was um, Paul, oh, I, 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 but, but saying you know. It, it seemed strange to me that you know people recognized me because I wasn't you know because I was only in one episode and, and they said well look if you look at the, the way it was written you know each episode there was probably 
you know, a visiting a guest actor who was only in one episode. So in a way, that's how it was. It, it worked, you know, it, they brought in different characters and then, but, you know, you, you had the characters who were the, the ones who ran through the whole thing. And then you brought in other characters who were probably only in one or two episodes. I did say to John Southern, no, oh, I think, you know, maybe, maybe Tony Angelina should come back. <laughs> yeah. But he obviously decided that, you know, you know that it, one was enough. Um, we'll always remember Tony Angelino. That's that, that, was the, that was the story. You know, that was the one episode done, dusted, on to the next one. And I was saying, fine, okay. So it, it, is, yeah. it is strange to me, in a way. It's amazing that, you know, the, all these years later, you know, I'm still, you know, well, we're talking now, for example. So I know that's not because of this episode. It's because of the success of the whole series and the fact that it, that the whole series is still going on. But it, it's testament to, you know, the, the genius of... John Sullivan and and the team that the crew that that, uh, that made it, but I gather you know actually it was, I think today, it probably wouldn't have got a second series. It's one of those because because I'm not sure if they were going to recommission re it in those days. I thought oh well you know, we'll give it a chance because I'm not sure that whether the the powers that be, um, correct me if I'm wrong. You probably know more than I do, but I that I think. I heard that they weren't sure whether they were going to give it a second series, and they thought, "Oh, well, might as well." And uh, and then it sort of picked up from there. Yeah, Whereas today they might, they might not do that. They might sort of say, "Well, you know, didn't really do it on the ratings. Um, let's let's try something else." Well, thanks a lot for joining us, Philip. We've run out of time now. Uh, cool? It's been lovely to have you on the show. We've got less than a minute. Yeah, I know. Hang about, though, Tony. Hang about. I'm going to make you witch. I've got some more bookings for you. <laughs> I'll have to get singing again, won't I? We'd love, love that. that. Seriously, people would pay good money for that. Definitely. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you? I can just about do it. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. <Very good. laughs> Thanks a lot, Philip. Uh, lovely you. to meet you all again. Nice good to meet you, Philip. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.